Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Federico. Um, I am Mark Tacone, uh, working at FAO in the Fisheries and Aquaculture Division, team leader of the Information and Knowledge Management, and uh, been associated with innovation on IT uh, and data sciences since uh, uh, two decades. Thank you. Then we can go with uh, Aureliano Gentile. Good morning, everybody. Aureliano Gentile, FAO Fisheries and Aquaculture Division, and uh, I'm um, involved in uh, different products uh, uh, developed uh, uh, within the Blue Cow project, uh, particularly the Global Record of Stocks and Fisheries. Thank you. Thanks, Aureliano. Uh, Yannis? Hello, good morning also from my side. Uh, my name is Yanis Marketaikis. I'm a research and development engineer in the Foundation of Research and Technology in Greece and uh, technology supervisor of the Center of Cultural Informatics in the same institute. Uh, I'm working on Blue Cloud, in particular in uh, demonstrator number four in Fisheries Atlas. And we are working as a technology provider for the global record of stocks and fisheries. Thank you. And uh, Julien? You're muted, uh, Julien. Julien? Maybe let's go with Emmanuel first, and then we go back to Julien. Hey, good morning, all. I'm Emmanuel Blondel. I'm working as a um, JS expert in our expert in the fisheries division mm -hmm. team. Um, so mainly uh, oriented on uh, the management and design of a special data infrastructure oriented to fisheries. Thank you. Julien, is your microphone working? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry for that. So my name is Julien Bard. I'm working for IRD, Institute of Research for Development, and I'm part of the team with firms that uh, is involved in the Global Tuna Atlas uh, and to, to create a, a global data set for, for these fisheries. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have Gianpaolo. Morning. <clears throat> I'm Gianpaolo Coro and I'm a researcher at the Science and Information Technologies Institute of CNR in Italy. And my research focuses on artificial intelligence, data mining, cloud computing, applied to marine biology, ecology, and ecosystems so with open science methodologies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and at this point, I would give the word back to Mark. Uh, so that we can get started with an introduction of this webinar. Thanks, everyone. Well, uh, thank you, Federico. So I will uh, share my screen. I have uh, only two or three slides to to display, um, and it is mostly to pack uh, the words I'm going to to give. Um, and you let me know, Federico, if you can see uh, if you can see uh, correctly the screen. I've, is it yes, if, is it it's like you, it's no. the it's the presenter view if you can just change the yeah and I'm trying to find um oh yes I know here now you see it um oh no. sorry I have to start again probably Is it correct? Yes. So we are going to deliver this presentation on the Fisheries Atlas um, with the colleagues who introduce themselves. You can see their name here. Uh, the Fisheries Atlas is a special data infrastructure where data are managed from, uh, as we say, from Fishnet to the internet for uh, an open and transparent approach to data science. This atlas has been steadily forged during nearly 15 years, uh, and it is a result uh, of an encounter between IT innovation initiatives and the World Fisheries Policy requirements to support decision making with scientific evidence. Uh, the Fisheries Atlas is now mature, and my introduction intends to briefly explain 
how it supports FAO's objectives in support of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, you may know that FAO is a custodian agency of 21 indicators of the SDGs, and in particular, Goal 14 to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources. I'm trying to move the slide, but I don't see it moving. Oh, there it is. So there is a target called uh, sustainable fisheries. It is a target 14.4. And uh, under this target, uh, the progress is monitored through uh, an indicator called uh, SDG 14.4.1. Uh, and its name is the proportion of uh, fish stocks within biological sustainable levels. Uh, at global level, um, we have uh, in FAO a methodology which has prevailed for, for decades. And you can see here, and uh, that uh, uh, the methodology uses uh, stock assessments, which are um, delivered by countries or by regional fishery bodies at regional level when the stocks are shared. And uh, the status of these stocks uh, is in a very short way averaged and provides the global indicator. Uh, but because we have not uh, assessments for all fish stocks in the world, uh, we also complement um, the uh, data and scientific knowledge with um, the statistics on uh, species which are caught worldwide and um, process these uh, to have a complete uh, uh, indicator. Now, uh, as we talk, this methodology is being updated uh, and this presentation intends to explain how the fisheries at last provide support to this indicator. Again, from fishnet to the internet, that is across all levels of the data value chain. So this slides add uh, this blue square that you can see here. And, and these components are components of the fisheries at last. And, uh, and you can see these uh, components uh, right from the uh, uh, national level uh, up to the global level. So uh, on the left, first at country level, we need to assist those countries willing to report their national indicator on the SDG 1441. Uh, so this implies uh, to help countries to collect data and statistics in a consistent and reliable way. And there, uh, since uh, two or three years, we have uh, uh, Calypso, which is a web-based platform, which can be deployed in countries for data collection, analysis, and statistical reporting. Calypso produces controlled and well-documented data, and Calypso reports can then be used by national assessment scientists in order to enable them to report on this indicator of fish stock sustainability. And then switch to the regional level. Countries also collaborate and share their statistics within regional fishery management organizations in order to assess jointly the shared stocks. Our ATLAS allows to upload, aggregate, and disseminate the national statistics collated at regional level. Uh, in blue here, we have a the example of um, WECAF, where we have the WECAF Central Atlantic Information System, which we call WECAFIS, as an example. Um, and uh, indeed, this process of uh, um, uh, aggregating um, scientific data on catch and effort uh, at regional level is quite widespread in the world. Uh, for example, uh, the five tuna regional fishery management organizations of the world also have their regional databases. Uh, and these regional databases are used by regional working groups on stock assessment. And there you have the um, status on uh, the shared stock at regional level. The same uh, fisheries atlas, the same infrastructure as will be presented, has been implemented in the form of the global tuna atlas 
for collation of high spatial resolution catch statistics among the five tuna uh, regional fishery management organizations. Um, the acronym is the GTA, and the GTA can be used to respond to science or policy issues at global scale, such as fishing strategies, fishery management scenarios, ecological and climate change questions. So this is about the, the flow of um, data and statistics uh, that has some results in terms of uh, fish, uh, fish stock status through the stock assessment that can be done through this uh, analysis of these statistics. And then another aspect of uh, the global SDG 1441 methodology is that it relies on the backbone of a comprehensive reference list of fish stocks. Collating such knowledge and updating it consist, uh, continuously is a gigantic uh, task, and this can only be achieved collaboratively. This is the role of this other component of the Fisheries Atlas, which we call the Global Record of Stocks and Fisheries, or GRSF, the blue square in the central part of, of the screen, which, as you can see, rides across the three levels, national, regional, and global. GRSF federates uh, the knowledge on the status of stocks from both the national and regional levels. And from a global perspective, when you start from the global indicator on SDG 1441, it provides a repository allowing users to trace back fish stock by fish stock, the scientific evidence which underlies the global indicator. Before concluding, um, I would like to add that while developing these tools, our innovation revolves around two key ideas. Uh, applying the FAIR principles of open data and uh, operating our tools on databases in sustainable ways. We will see that both aspects require a strong emphasis on applying the international statistical and data standards. So, <clears throat> We will now introduce some collaborations in this DSDI that show how uh, collaborations for innovation in geospatial data management can help achieve the four FAO betters, better production, better nutrition, better environment, better life. And uh, we will start uh, with uh, Aureliano Gentile. He will introduce uh, more in details the global record of stocks and fisheries and the global tuna atlas. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. I think it's my turn to go ahead. I trust you see my screen. And therefore, let's see, uh, now let's uh, run a bit uh, around this uh, uh, two of the components of the fisheries atlas, the global record of stocks and fisheries and the global tuna atlas. The GRSF, uh, the acronym for the global record of stocks and fisheries has two technical objectives in support of two policy goals. registering the, uh, a comprehensive list of stocks and fisheries as part of a global repository, and federated knowledge on status and trends of stocks and fisheries across various sources. And therefore, the, the tool, the knowledge base, uh, it, it offers services to science stakeholders involved in regional global state of stocks indicators, the status of stock, and public and private actors involved in eco-labeling traceability sustainable fisheries, traceability along the value chain. So these are the two main use cases for which the GSF has been developed. The GSF enabled the collation, standardization, and harmonization across multiple data providers 
to facilitate and promote the monitoring of all world stocks and fishery status and trends. Here you see the list of uh, four database sources which uh, contribute to the GRSF under the FIRMS governance. FIRMS is an information sharing network. Um, it's an arrangement uh, within uh, FAO being the secretary. And this arrangement includes uh, um, over uh, 22 uh, regional fishery bodies. And uh, under such governance, uh, four databases are providing the information to the GRSF. The firms itself, the RAM Legacy Stock Assessment Database, Fish Source, and the FAO SDG 14.4.1 questionnaire, for which FAO is a custodian agency. At the end, this uh, is acting a global repository of a transparent inventory of stocks and fishery records. GSF offering a comprehensive uh, worldwide coverage of over 2,000 fish stock records at the moment. Let's see some insights how it works. Um, the first uh, innovation in GSF is uh, introducing uh, universally unique identifiers, UUIDs, applied to stocks and fisheries, uh, which is uh, a new innovative uh, global standard. Uh, this slide on the left, is, it is showing um, the Mediterranean area uh, with a population of anchovy. Indeed, these are, um, this population uh, is indeed broken down into uh, a number of assessment units uh, all over the um, Mediterranean Sea. And for each of these, a uh, unique identifier is assigned. So this um, standard and this um, um, logic is a web resolvable digital identifier to respond to whatever IT standard. Here you see an example of a URL where the resolver can be customized and uh, which is the um, purple uh, part and the red part, the UID persists in case of changes of uh, the semantic identifier. We will see in a second what it is. Uh, downloading this uh, PowerPoint, you can try with uh, the QR code uh, with your phone and uh, accessing the, the information behind. To couple the, to accompany the, so, um, the UIDs, um, we have also envisaged uh, human readable identifiers, which is uh, what we call uh, a semantic identifier a combination um, of standards from international and uh, regional uh, and national standards, particularly CLP and firms, for those who are knowledgeable on that. And um, a stock and a fishery can be identified with a um, combination of namespaces and codes, which uh, people can read it uh, or experts uh, can read it and understand. Um, what uh, what stock or what fishery is described. Um, then the codes are uh, codified and uh, full label, uh, fully uh, understandable are then displayed. Examples how uh, such a UAD can be used here in, in this uh, scenario. You, you see how um, you can imagine how um, a fish bean from uh, from a market is uh, properly meta informed and uh, UID are assigned to the fishery resources and with your phone or, or with a computer or tablet you can access uh, the information behind um, identity of the stock where this has been taken you can um, uh, visualize the location in the world where this um, fishery resource is coming from as well as uh, any uh, um, official um, indication on the stock status. Um, another example here is, uh, uh, we would like to highlight how the, the importance of uh, uh, adding the UIDs in the source databases of uh, uh, those databases uh, uh, contributing to the GSF, but also any others. Recently, we received a request of adding the UIDs uh, from an aquarium in the US. Um, so uh, this um, addition of uh, UIDs um, allow the information globally retrieved 
uh, thus federating knowledge on status of stocks from the national and regional level. And this is an example how the all the uh, UIDs can then populate a map and uh, you can retrieve all the information federating from the different sources, which is not a mix up, a merge, but is a collation of information, each datum properly referenced. The blue cloud is handled in different environment without getting too much in the detail, but we are today disseminating a catalog of records a geospatial interface, which we call a map viewer, and uh, um, for advanced use, the web services and competency queries. All this is powered by our colleague from the National Research Council of Italy, the CNR, and uh, uh, Ford, um, uh, uh, research center in Greece. Uh, colleagues will talk uh, uh, later. Now, um, let me uh, describe another product of the Fisheries Atlas, which is the uh, firm's Global Tuna Atlas, GTA. The Tuna Atlas builds on historical atlases, which were merged in 2019 into one coordinated initiative and the governance responsi responsibility of the firm's partnership. Indeed, this is a product uh, um, started many, many years ago, and today we are uh, now um, offering a new version uh, much more innovative uh, in comparison with the past. All currently available information is provided by the five tuna regional fishery management organization, namely CCSBT, ICAT, YATTC, IOTC, WCPFC, SPC. These are the five tuna regional uh, fishery management organization all over the world. The atlas facilitate access to authoritative specialized five degrees or one degree squares and standardized public data on tuna fisheries, offering a comprehensive overview of the catches about 50 tuna and tuna-like species by industrial. Period from 950 to 2019, and increasing artisanal fisheries, and data for 100 bycatch species, including several species of pelagic sharks. Here I took the license to quote uh, what uh, our colleague Marta Cone um, stated, in the uh, official launch of the GTA. The film's Global Tuna Atlas is an uh, innovative web product that presents in a user-friendly interface, authoritative and standardized public data on tuna fisheries. It was made possible thanks to a strong and long-lasting partnership and a broad range of scientific and technical expertise. By facilitating access to high quality and specialized data, this address intends to provide the kind of science that experts need to address critical issues such as adaptation to climate change or sustainable fisheries management. The Tuna Atlas uh, is uh, actually a multifaceted product. We have the map viewer, indeed uh, implementing the FAIR principle. It's public, you can access it. You have the metadata catalog, Increased data sets outreach and enable cross referencing through DOIs, digital object identifiers. Uh, we are using the Zenoto platform. Our colleague later on, um, Mr. Julian Barr from IRD, will better elaborate this part of DOIs. And also, um, attached to the DOIs, we have a standardized publicly accessible uh, data sets. Uh, annual um, nominal catch data set and three geo referenced monthly catch data sets. Therefore, we have uh, the five organization contributing, 26 distinct uh, fishing years, about 300 distinct species, and timelines spanning over 100 years. So you can imagine the amount of information and data behind uh, this uh, tuna atlas. The sustainability of this product is based uh, on these points, a data sharing agreement with the tuna bodies under the firm's governance. We leverage international standards and best practices for data management, accessing and sharing. And these are the acronyms for the standards from the FAIR principle, the OGC for geospatial, CWP, um, statistical standards, ISO. The ATRAS was made possible through the support of innovative information technologies from a range of uh, EU uh, 2020 projects, including Blue Bridge and Blue Cloud, with key contribution from the French Institute for Sustainable Development, IRD, 
as well uh, is a firm's collaborative partner. So all of these uh, are elements contributing to the sustainability for a long lasting products um, within the fisheries atlas. In conclusion, a key message I would like to convey is that the fisheries atlas is building innovative, sustainable tools to share data and information, apply, applying fire principle and international statistical and data standards towards holistic approaches to contribute to better knowledge on food security and nutrition. Thank you. So I'm not going to focus on data management for the Global Tuna Atlas and give details about uh, good practices we try to implement uh, for this part of the work. So about fisheries data that we are managing, uh, we created a generic workflow that uh, aims to standardize uh, fisheries data time series with a strong focus on tuna, as has been said by uh, Aureliano. And the main, <clears throat> main uh, goal is to harmonize the data structure of uh, tuna RFMOs and make them compliant with uh, CWP standards for fisheries data and so some of the standards that I'm going to present uh, in the coming slides. So basically, we want to merge data to turn regional data, data sets into a global data set. And we focus uh, principally, principally on ungraded data from tuna RFMOs. Which, uh, with the following structure, uh, in terms of variables, uh, the first uh, variable we, we focus on is uh, catches, but now we are working on fishing efforts, and we also target uh, variables like conversion factors and size class. In terms of dimensions, we have like species, area, period, fishing fleet, fishing gears, school type, and so on. So this generic workflow has also been tested uh, to manage to manage higher resolution data like AIS, VMS, or fishing aggregating devices. And we also aim uh, at using this workflow for uh, more uh, high resolution data like tagging data. So this generic workflow uh, try to, to, to implement the, the good practices for open science and fair data management. So it's entirely driven by rich metadata. They, metadata that describe uh, the, the, the core elements for uh, to facilitate uh, data discovery, but also richer metadata for uh, to, to facilitate the, the reuse of the data sets. Interoper interoperability is a, is, a, is a very important goal for us. We try to comply with as many standards as possible. And reproducibility is as well uh, a key issue for us since we are a team and we need uh, different people to be able to uh, replicate this work. So we provide some open source code in R to generate some open data sets. And we, we use a runtime env environment that is provided by the Blue Cloud project to execute this R code within a virtual research environment. So about the, the metadata-driven workflow, as I said, data and code are described by rich metadata that are driving the process, the different process steps of the workflow. So we, we have a high um, focus on, uh, uh, on standards to foster interoperability, meaning that uh, we implement some uh, standards that are uh, widely used for discovery uh, metadata to foster data discovery so that data are easy to find as expected by fair uh, data management principles. So for that, we use Dublin Core and data sites. Uh, we want also the, the, our data sets to be uh, reusable. So for that, uh, we have a, a strong effort uh, describing uh, how data have been generated, uh, describing the provenance, meaning the, pro the different process steps that, that have been applied to raw data to build this global data set. For that, we use standards like the, the well-known uh, OGC ISO 19115, but we also have like uh, more accurate uh, standards like the OGC feature catalog standard that enables to describe the data structure, the name of columns, the values, the code list, and so on. And uh, as it's been said by uh, Aureliano already, we, we assign DOIs uh, that manage as well the, 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 the information about citation and uh, licensing. In addition to this uh, 
already quite rich metadata standards, we, we generate as well a, a set of ad hoc metadata for, for the very specific uh, domain of fisheries data. And we build some metrics indicators uh, that are really tied to the, the fisheries data domain. And we are able to uh, automate the generation of this uh, metadata within uh, dynamic reports in R Markdown or Shiny Apps. Um, about uh, the compliance with standards, just a few additional words, as it's already been said in a previous uh, slide, but uh, the point here is that we focus on both aspects of uh, interoperability, meaning the syntactic interoperability and semantic interoperability, meaning that, uh, as I said, uh, we use standards for data discovery, but also for um, uh, richer uh, metadata standards like the feature catalog to describe the da data structure. And we try as much as possible uh, to use uh, OGC standard for geospatial data to uh, package uh, our metadata or data into formats that, that can be used by uh, as many people as possible. We also provide this information through uh, widely used access protocols like uh, CSW for metadata or WMS, WFS that are OGC standards uh, widely used by uh, GIS community. Uh, CWP standard is the data structure that is uh, uh, promoted uh, for fisheries uh, data and that is described also by uh, OGC feature catalog. Regarding semantic interoperability, uh, we provide keywords uh, that can be ma managed either by terms or URIs uh, within uh, our metadata. So this is a strong connection to uh, uh, be able to connect some controlled vocabularies or ontologies. And regarding the values that are uh, uh, used uh, within CSVs uh, datasets we generate, uh, we use uh, as much as possible standards like as fish for species or some other standards for fishing gears or fishing kit. So about reproducibility, uh, this is the cornerstone of open science. And as I said, we need to uh, replicate this workflow uh, often. And uh, it's tested uh, uh, by multiple users so, so that every year we are able to generate a new version of, uh, of these data sets. So reproducibility is a, is, a, is a key issue for us. And to manage that, uh, we share codes uh, on GitHub repositories. We use our software that is widely used in the fisheries uh, community. And we use as well a library that is dedicated to workflow or orchestration, uh, which is the GeoFlow R library. And as I said before, the R code is executed uh, by using a collaborative runtime environment, which is a virtual research environment provided by uh, Blue Cloud Project and uh, Deep Earth Science Infrastructure. So the execution on our pieces comes last, and uh, the, the focus of our work is to use uh, collaborative tools. Open data and source code are, as I said, uh, made available online. They have uh, DOIs for, for, for the data, so you can find them uh, online uh, on, uh, on the global uh, fisheries uh, atlas, June atlas uh, viewer, but also on Zenodo. Uh, same process will be applied to uh, our R code. Uh, we are currently trying to improve them, and at some point we will assign DOIs to this uh, GitHub repository so that they can be as well uh, seen uh, as a specific object of the of the workflow. Uh, so here is what uh, it means for from the user's point of view. Uh, you will access uh, tuna fisheries data and find tuna fisheries uh, data uh, online on Zenodo with DOIs. And uh, if you look at uh, these DOIs uh, on the Zenodo web pages, you will see that you, you have different versions of the same data set that are uh, actually, the, the 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 yearly updates that we plan to run in the in the coming year. So in ten years, we you might have ten different versions of the of the same data data set that has been updated. And at the end, uh, we aim at producing a data paper that describes this whole process to clarify what has been done. So, last slide is about uh, the the virtual research environment that we use that is provided by the Blue Cloud project. 
uh, hosted by before science and in the more general context of uh, EOS, European Open Science Cloud. Um, this very is a huge step uh, forward since uh, we can uh, use online some widely used software, uh, for example, for R, as I said, that we use. We can have online RStudio server, Shiny Apps, or Jupyter Notebooks that are different ways that are very uh, frequently used by, by the users in our community. And once we have been able to generate these data sets, we can load them into a special data infrastructure that is also entirely uh, hosted by this virtual research environment. And we found here some uh, tools like PostGIS, GeoNetwork, and GeoServer. And I, I'm, this is my last point. Uh, some Docker images are more and more used to run these uh, components into the virtual research environment, which makes uh, this whole workflow and the runtime envir environment more and more robust over the years. So in conclusion, um, Fisheries Atlas uh, is a generic workflow. Uh, it's a collaborative effort and we share collaborative tools. It's been tested uh, on tuna fisheries. Uh, it's generic, but uh, already reused for some other species. So it can be tailored and customized. It's reproducible and transparent. And at the end, data are loaded and managed into a special data infrastructure that feeds the uh, tools that uh, have been uh, displayed by uh, Aureliano before. So now I will let the floor to Gianpaolo Coro, and I thank you for listening. Perico. <clears throat> Jean Paolo, can you sh share your uh, screen? Yeah. Yes. So it's my turn. Okay. Here we are. So in this presentation, I'm going to explain how the combination of three technologies, such as AI, open science infrastructures, can manage problems related to big data and model integration from multiple sources. So that how to basically use what we have seen so far. So essentially, uh, you know that uh, uh, big data are everywhere today, and big data, but big data are not just large volume data, but there are also other key concepts related to big data, such as the high generation generation velocity of the data, the untrustworthiness of the contained information, and the high complexity of data representation. So, extracting knowledge from big data requires innovative computer science tools. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there are many examples of big data uh, in marine science that I will cite in this presentation. For example, vessel transmitted information, climate change data, species observation, and biodiversity data. So everybody today has an intuition of what artificial intelligence is. But in the reality, an AI system is a computer science system that is capable of accomplishing, accomplishing tasks perceived as intelligent so that they can simulate human intelligence. And you know that big companies are investing very much in AI, but AI is by definition multidisciplinary and really based, strongly based on collaboration between people during experimentation. So uh, some innovation is needed by big data and AI. Uh, and this innovation uh, regards data gap filling, especially while also improving the transparency of the models and the computer science systems, which are usually seen as black boxes. And additionally, the published data and the results uh, need to be complete and transparency <clears throat> as well. And finally, uh, also, so multidisciplinarity needs really needs uh, real-time collaboration to be effective, which is key assets of the uh, uh, system for big data processing. So open science, uh, it was born in this context uh, as a paradigm to support collaborative experimentation and guarantee the reproducibility repeatability and reusability of data and processes. So in this case, we are not just talking about data, but also processes. So the, the scientific methodologies should be uh, transparent and uh, uh, accessibility should be granted at, at all levels. 
and uh, also uh, while also managing big data using distributed or high performance computing platforms. You know that TAU has been supporting open science uh, for more than 10 years, more or less now. So, uh, well, open science infrastructures are systems uh, that support AI and big data uh, processing uh, within open science. An infrastructure is a network of hardware and software resources, for example, databases, uh, services, servers, web interfaces that support collaboration between scientists. And, uh, um, well, infrastructure use uh, virtual research environments to accomplish uh, the, the, this task to support collaboration by temporarily assigning a subset of the resources to a specific community or practice you see in this as you see in this slide. Practically speaking, virtual, uh, virtual research, research environment appears as a set of web interfaces where scientists can run experiments together, share data, and post information. Uh, the D4 Science infrastructure used by the Blue Cloud uh, um, project and the other project, European projects before and those international projects uh, supports many virtual research environments uh, that uh, support uh, themselves uh, from stock assessment, marine biology communities to geology, cultural heritage and uh, educational communities of practice. So in the next slides, I'm going to give you examples uh, of questions in marine science that uh, virtual research environments can answer by combining different big data sources and models from different domains, among which you will see also the data we have seen so far. So the first question is, why is the species in a certain place? And of course, which will be the effects of climate change on species distribution? So this issue is uh, usually addressed by combining the big data collected from large observation data producers like OBIS and GBIF with the big data of environmental parameters uh, published by other uh, large data providers. And the combination is often conducted through an AI model that discovers the species preferences for specific environmental con uh, conditions. And then the model projects these preferences worldwide. And you can see in these images, there are red regions uh, that indicate more suitable areas for the species to prosper. Um, another question is, um, can, we, uh, uh, can we combine different AI models um, to uh, prevent species invasions? So, um, uh, in this in this example, you see uh, the, the the case of the silver cheek toadfish, a highly toxic puffer fish, uh, which is a plague in the Mediterranean Sea, <clears throat> and the spread of this um, of this species was predicted through the combination of several AI models that had uh, complementary aspects. Um, and we obtained in this case a regime uh, situation, a scenario for the distribution of these species that was then projected on the Mediterranean countries to also predict uh, an invasion risk. And, uh, and so uh, I would like also to cite that, uh, um, to mention that uh, the transparency and repeatability of uh, this approach and the experiment. Uh, was sufficient to make them make the result included in the FAO advices for the Mediterranean and the Black Sea countries. So another question is, can we fill so survey data gaps? So think, uh, for example, uh, of <clears throat> uh, scientific surveys that uh, every year measure the biomass of some stock in a certain um, in a certain area, and for example, in 2020. Here, you can see here in this slide, um, you can see the surveyed location as red circles in these images. For reasons in 2020, especially related to COVID restrictions, surveys could not visit the green circle areas, but scientists did need that, that information to correctly estimate stock biomass. So uh, by combining models coming from completely different disciplines, we could answer this question in this case. 
In particular, uh, we used digital signal processing to forecast biomass in 2020 uh, based on historical data. We used an, an oceanographic algorithm to extend the biomass from the known location to the unknown lo locations. And we also used a species distribution model to estimate if habitat was suitable for the species um, in those uh, locations in 2020. So altogether, these models coming from different disciplines were able to, through their combination, to give us the answer about the, um, the stock biomass in the uh, unknown locations. So um, another question is, can we detect unreported fishing activity? So, and this question can be answered by, uh, answered by integrating different big data sources, among which you, you see also the global record of stock and fisheries. For example, we, can, we could combine in this example for the Adriatic Sea vessel coordinate data with an AI algorithm to reconstruct fishing activity and unreported fishing activity. Then we use the global record of stock and fisheries to discover the involved stocks and the IUCN red list to check uh, their vulnerability status. And the extracted information was crucial also to inform stock assessment models and to integrate fishing, fisheries monitoring data. And in the animation, you can see here, you can see uh, the unreported trolling hotspots in 2019 uh, produced with this method in the Adriatic. The final question instead is how much fish can we catch next year? So this question requires combining the results from the previous models and also many of the mentioned data sources um, to estimate the maximum catch that can be taken from a commercial species in a certain area. So that catch exactly or more or less corresponds to repopulation uh, of that species in the next year. So the question essentially is how to make fisheries sustainable. And thanks to the transparent uh, approaches that have been developed so far um, and uh, their open science compliance, uh, these models have been now included in polit the political agendas, which is very important achievement for AI today. And finally, in conclusion, uh, the innovation of open science, uh, uh, especially uh, for what regards AI, is to um, lies in the possibility to reuse methodologies from different disciplines, integrate fair big data, use and publish data and models uh, under uh, recognized standards, and overall foster the transparency, repeatability, and reproducibility of the experiments. And this is also the key to convince also decision makers to consider the results in their decision workflows. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gianpaolo. And we can move on to Yannis. Yes, uh, thank you. Let me share my screen. Uh, Gianpaolo, can you stop yeah, sharing Gianpaolo. your screen? Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, now I will uh, describe you the, the technical backbone of the global record of stocks and fisheries, which is one part of the, of the fisheries atlas. And uh, I will describe you in more details the, the reason we, why we used uh, semantic web technologies to, to construct it and maintain it. So the first question is why semantic web? If we could uh, find a, a, an informal uh, way to, to describe why what the semantic web is, is that uh, semantic web tries to uh, extend the principles of the web in the world of data, which means that uh, semantic web tries to identify a data and assign, assign to the data uh, particular identifiers, for example, URIs. It tries to connect two different uh, data resources by using those identifiers and, of course, enable their sharing and reuse. And it has a lot of a lot of tools in terms of modeling, in terms of querying languages, mechanism, best practices to do these things. Now, uh, we we adopted smart web technologies in order to construct 
a knowledge base of stocks and fisheries for uh, GRSF. And uh, we want to do it because it, uh, it allowed us to integrate data that are heterogeneous, they come from different data sources. It allowed to connect those uh, resources that are found in the different uh, databases. Uh, of course, it allows us to publish data according to best practices and the linked open data principles and expose those information in, uh, in, a, in a uniform manner. And uh, last but, but not least, it allows us to answer queries that we couldn't answer uh, by the individual uh, data sources. And the way we do it is that we adopted uh, particular models, particular ontologies, for example, uh, the ISO standard CEDUC CRM, Marine DLO, uh, VOID, and others. Uh, we relied on W3C standards, in particular on the resource description framework and the Sparkle query language. And of course, we uh, implemented some, some tools for the automation of the construction and the refreshment of the, of the knowledge base, as I will show uh, later on. Uh, the way we did it is that we actually semantically uh, integrated the data. So we were able to have a 360 view of the data. As, it, as I said, this, allow us, this allows us to uh, integrate data coming from different sources that are heterogeneous structurally and semantically. It allows us to support complex query answering. And most importantly, it does not invalidate the process that the individual data sources have adopted so far. So the individual data sources continue to use their own models and their own tools and their own uh, policies to maintain and update their databases. And we actually fetch, harvest those information and construct a, a knowledge base. But just to give you an example about how semantic data integration works, here you can see uh, how different data sources uh, describe the same, the same thing, in particular uh, a species. Uh, you can see four different, five different data sources here. Uh, by the way, all of them are, are included in, in GRSF. We have firms, RAM, and fishers that provide stocks and fisheries information, and uh, worms and fish base that uh, we harvest information about species from these sources. And you can see how uh, this, these data sources describe their information, either it is identifier or complementary information about these species. So you can see that each source describes some aspects of that, of that species. But if we semantically integrate those data sources, we have something like this. So we have a more holistic view of, uh, of uh, those resources, not only species, but in general, everything. So let's see how we constructed uh, GRSF. Uh, as Aureliano Gentile showed you before, we have started with uh, originally three data sources, and then a fourth one came into the game. Uh, so we have four different data sources, each one with uh, its own uh, data structure, its own format. You can see that we have data databases in Excel format, other uh, in XML, other as SQL databases. So what we do is that we actually fetch and transform those uh, the information from those sources with respect to the ontologies we are using. And we construct a staging knowledge base, as we call it. Then we apply some uh, functions, some functions on top of this knowledge base, which is normalizing and cleaning the data in order to homogenize them. And we also apply dissection and merging activities. And I will show you later on what dissection and merging is. At, at this stage, we have created a, let's say, stable version of the knowledge base. So we publish all those records in the public version of the knowledge base, and we publish them in a, in a catalog where then curators can actually ac access the data, validate the data, create the data. And of course, public users can exploit those, those data. This is the construction workflow, the workflow that we're using for constructing uh, the knowledge base at the first time. We also have the evolution workflow, the refresh workflow, that allow us to refresh periodically in an automatic manner uh, the knowledge base. And we have to do it because, as I said, the original databases continue to evolve. So uh, we have new stocks, we have updated stocks and fisheries. So we want to catch all those updates and reflect it into our knowledge base. So instead of reconstructing the knowledge base, 
uh, from scratch, we actually refresh it. And uh, by, by this, we actually preserve also all the curation activities that are done by GRSF administrators. And of course, we remove records that are no longer, that do not longer exist, or we archive them if we have to. Now, let me give you uh, some more details about the merging and the dissection activities. Uh, the the first, first, first one is the merging activity, and we apply this activity if we want to uh, create a, a new record that combines information from other records from different sources. So in this example, you can see that we have uh, on the left, you have, we have two stock records, uh, each one coming from a different data source. And, uh, but, but these stocks describe the same thing, describe the same stock. So it's a stock in the, about the same species in the same area. So we actually merge those records and we create a merged record that combines information from those sources. The dissection is uh, exactly the opposite. So we have records and we want to dissect it to more fine-grained records. So in this example, we have a fishery record coming from, uh, from a data source, from firms, for example. And you can see that this fishery record describes uh, some details about two uh, different species. So in GRSF, we dissect it into two concrete uh, GRSF fishery records, each one with its own species. This is an overview of the species that we have uh, in GRSF. You, you, here you will see only three of the sources that we are using. You will not see the results of, from uh, VSDG 14.4.1 questionnaire yet, because this is something that we uh, currently are working on. But you can see the statistics about uh, the data coming from the different sources. And in the last column, the statistics about the records that exist in GRSF. And you will notice that uh, we have a lot of fishery. We have uh, something more than uh, 14,000 fishery records compared to the overall number of records uh, from uh, firms and fishers. And this is exactly the result of the dissection process. Now, as regards the, the, the service and the tools, uh, we have uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of services, application frameworks and tools for carrying out different things, starting from the ETL workflow that we use for harvesting, constructing, and refreshing GRSF, which is the GRSF services transform workflow. We also have the GRSF services core that provides all the core services for publishing, updating, and of course, carrying out the merging and dissection processes of, uh, of GRSF. We also have the updater service that allow us to update GRSF records based on the uh, validation and the curation that is carried out by GRSF administrators. Uh, re recently, we have started implementing a vocabulary, which is a service that provides code lists and vocabulary, for example, about species, water areas, fishing gears, and, and others. Uh, we also have a, a RESTful API that exposes the contents of, of GRSF and uh, everybody can use it. And of course, we have a set of competency questions that are uh, commonly used questions that retrieve information from, uh, from GRSF knowledge base. And uh, these are some screenshots of the, of the service and the tools that I've uh, just uh, described. Now, last but not least, uh, all these processes and all these services have, uh, have a strong and uh, uh, big uh, research and innovation background. And we have uh, uh, published uh, many of, of our works in, in uh, conference and, and journals. And here you can see an indicative list of, uh, of those publications. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yannis. Um, at this point, I would give the word to Anton and, and Mark to close the, the presentations. Okay, <clears throat> well, uh, I'll go first. Uh, so thanks everybody. So if there are questions, we ask you to uh, post them in the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom. If not so, I will make a very quick uh, summary. So after the um, introduction of Mark Taconet, who introduced the importance of uh, this um, platform, this approach of a spatial data infrastructure, but then not only a spatial data infrastructure, but also the, the tools and uh, related um, um, tools to 
harvest and manage all the fisheries data uh, as an important uh, platform to inform on the SDGs and to help FAO achieve the four betters. We had a presentation of Aureli Aurelian Gentile, also of FAO, who introduced the global record of stocks and fisheries. So the, the functions of the global record of stocks and fisheries, the type of data, where you can access this. Uh, we provided a few links where you can in the future go back and access the global record of stocks and fisheries and also the global tuna atlas, also a the second main component of the fisheries atlas that is now published by FAO and accessible um, online. <clears throat> Then we had uh, Julian Bart, who introduced the, a bit more the approach that the vision we have in the management of the data for coming from the fisheries domain for the Global Tuna Atlas. So what do we think are important steps and where should we leave a trace? So how do we make this uh, a fair workflow that is uh, reproducible and truly interoperable by relying on, uh, on international standards for data management? Then Gianpaolo Coro gave a few nice examples of uh, what is big data analysis in the fisheries domain and where can we think about in the future. So not so much about the in the FEO domain where we have to inform on, uh, on uh, a bit more, a few more restrictions on what we can publish. But um, from a scientific perspective, he gave very nice examples of how we already are getting close to sharing data uh, with the scientific uh, experts that develop new technologies that do new and innovative data analysis using AI and uh, big data approaches, also using FEO data already. So it's a good example of where we can dream about uh, in the future. And then uh, Janus uh, explained very nicely what the semantic technologies behind the global record of stocks and fisheries. So what the concepts are, uh, what, the, what the approach is and how it can help us to organize our data and give a 360 degree view on our data, which is uh, with traditional database technology sometimes uh, a bit more cumbersome. And then it um, all came together in the, uh, in, the, in the links that we have provided in the chat. So if you want to see more about the global record of stocks and fisheries and the global tuna atlas, uh, please use the links. And if you have any questions, use now the chat or come back to us later. We are always here to answer questions. So maybe Mark for the grand final, final words for you. And thanks everybody for presenting and participating and for Federico and the Blue Cloud projects. Also important to mention again that we received substantial support from the EU uh, Horizon 2020 to continue this work that started already before we went into the Blue Cloud. And that also will continue in a next phase in the Blue Cloud 26 with uh, some participants that are, have been presenting today. So thank you. Great, Anton. Um... Yeah, grand final may be a bit of an exaggeration, but um, I hope that uh, we were together able to convey our holistic vision of metadata-driven uh, data systems. Um, as you can understand, uh, uh, managing data or fishes data is a, a huge and complex responsibility. Um, and um, it has to be sustainable in the long term. Uh, FAO provides uh, services to its members and member countries uh, based on uh, on those innovations. And uh, we have this responsibility. We need to ensure that this is uh, done uh, uh, in, in the long term. Uh, collaborations are key for that um, uh, because first it provides a, the broad range of scientific uh, disciplines that we need. Uh, to assemble uh, uh, this, these tools and workflow. Uh, indeed, it makes developments uh, more slowly, uh, but at the same time, it's more exciting for everyone and enriching for sure. And for most, again, it enables um, a sustainable infrastructure because we share the effort uh, for the long term. You can see here probably that we are used to work together uh, during the last 10 years or so. Uh, we've been aligning ourselves and progressively uh, putting more efficiently our capacities. Um, so, and I think, yes, this, this webinar is a good example that showcases this collaboration. So we look for a, open, uh, a data science approach which is open and, and transparent. Uh, and we welcome other initiatives that want to reuse data uh, and further develop the Atlas. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. I would like to also say that uh, our Fisheries and Aquaculture Division assists with many other initiatives to improve uh, data management in fisheries and aquaculture. 
and for aquaculture tomorrow there is another um, uh, event um, which uh, Anton will uh, will lead about detecting uh, from the sky and from the ground uh, uh, cages and and ponds uh, for for culturing uh, shrimps or uh, other type of fish. Um, and I, I was talking about an holistic approach beyond the specific policy objective of uh, 1441 SDG indicator. Um, we have uh, uh, opening to, to other approaches. Uh, as you could see, Giampaolo gave a, a sense of how he would use uh, unique identifiers of stocks in his uh, artificial intelligence modeling. Um, for uh, assessing or filling gaps or assessing uh, impacts of fishing. Uh, we also have another application that connects um, uh, stocks uh, with the uh, um, assessing the nutrition uh, of, um, of the origins of, of fish. Uh, and that provides better knowledge on food security and nutrition. Uh, so <clears throat> the sense of uh, um, these applications which are uh, connected and which can uh, enrich each other and provide uh, ideas for a new and innovative science. And, and with that, I will stop. Um, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you to my colleagues for um, their efforts to deliver a consistent and comprehensive presentation on uh, our uh, innovative data science. Uh, and I welcome, uh, I wish you a good day.